Hello and welcome everyone. This is lecture 18 of this series of lectures. This series is regarding fluids, electrolytes, and acid-base disorders. It is meant to accompany, expand, and explain my book, Manual of Fluid, Electrolyte, and Acid-Base Disorders, A Pathophysiologic Approach to Common Clinical Problems. I'm Dr. Mohamed Tinawi. I'm a nephrologist in Northwest Indiana. This is the book. You can find it on Amazon as an ebook and also as a paperback. I'll provide more information in the description below. Please subscribe to the channel if you haven't already done so, like the videos. We are still on chapter two. It is hypokalemia, and this is part four. Today we are going to discuss potassium balance. Potassium balance. As we said, the kidneys maintain potassium homeostasis. So in a steady state, potassium intake equals potassium excretion. Actually, in a steady state, sodium intake, magnesium intake, calcium intake, phosphate intake pretty much equals excretion. So this is going to repeat itself uh, with the, every electrolyte that we're going to explain later. So this is actually what a steady state means. Extracellular potassium is maintained within a narrow range, so between 3.5 to 5, because potassium can easily move into or out of skeletal muscles. We said skeletal muscles contain 70% of intracellular potassium, and most of the potassium is inside the cells. This prevents big shifts in extracellular potassium concentration. Potassium movement is regulated mainly by insulin and catecholamines. Both drive potassium into the cells. Question. We said in lecture one on potassium, so this is part one of potassium lectures, that the extracellular fluid potassium content is only 60 to 80 mL equivalent or millimoles. This is about 2% of total body potassium. The intracellular is 3,000 to 4,000. So if we have a 70 kilogram man with an extracellular volume of 0.6 times 70, approximately 42 liters, let's assume that he ingests a high potassium meal. This sounds like something I do a lot. 84 mil equivalent. Let's assume that the pre-meal potassium is 5 what is the post-meal potassium going to be? So if he ingests 84, and this 84 is going to be distributed over 42 liters, then each liter is going to have an increase in potassium by 2. So if we start by f with 5, we're going to end up with 5 plus 2, 7. Is this person at risk of having a fatal arrhythmia? Do we die every time we ingest a high potassium meal? Does it really reach 7? No, of course not. No. Post-meal potassium will not be 7 anyway. Why? Because of intracellular shift of potassium. So mainly potassium will be shifted into the muscles until it's properly excreted, until it's properly dealt with by the kidneys. This is why we don't die after ingesting a high potassium meal. Actually, potassium will be minimally elevated after a meal. Let's continue our discussion on potassium balance. We said that insulin shifts potassium intracellularly, how it activates the sodium potassium ATPase pump. Therefore, three sodium will go out, two potassium will go in, and this is the effect of insulin. Not just insulin. Catecholamines do the same thing by activating beta-2 receptors. So potassium will go into the cells, sodium will go out. After a meal, insulin secretion happens. This not only will drive glucose into the muscles, but also will shift potassium into the cells until it's dealt with properly by the kidneys, meaning until it's excreted by the kidneys. Therefore, we do not get hyperkalemia. Now, what happens with acidosis? We have two types of acidosis. We're going to discuss that in detail when we talk about uh, metabolic acidosis. We have normal anion gap acidosis, also known as hyperchloremic acidosis or mineral acidosis. And we have high anion gap acidosis. So the gap can be either normal or high. Now, in normal anion gap hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis, we get hyperkalemia. Why? Because potassium will exit the cells, okay? It will be driven 
extracellularly, from inside the cell out. Why? Because hydrogen will have to go into the cells to be, to be buffered. But since hydrogen and potassium both are positive ions, when hydrogen goes in, potassium will go out. This is the effect of mineral acidosis or hyperchloremic acidosis or normal anion gap acidosis. It's the same thing on the sodium hydrogen exchanger in the skeletal muscles. Now, this does not happen in high anion gap metabolic acidosis and in respiratory acidosis. You can get a minimal effect on potassium distribution. And I'm going to discuss that in more detail when we talk about acidosis, but keep that in mind. This may be uh, commonly asked uh, on a test. Okay. In case of an increase in serum osmolality, like in case of hyperglycemia, water moves out of the cells. So what happens when water moves out is going to drag some of potassium with it. You're going to get a little bit of potassium efflux. And this will raise potassium in the extracellular fluids. Now let's look at this table. Let's summarize what causes potassium to shift intracellularly inside the cells. Insulin does it, catecholamines via the effect on the beta-2 receptors, and alkalemia. Okay, so any rise, any uh, any uh, or any rise in uh, pH, so alkalemia. Now, on the other hand, things that will make potassium shift extracellularly, meaning cause a rise in potassium. Possibly hyperkalemia is increase in osmolality. Like we said, water moves out and drags with it potassium, so we get potassium efflux. And also we said mineral acidosis, normal anion gap, not high anion gap. Again, normal anion gap, metabolic, hyperchloremic acidosis can cause a rise in potassium via effect on the sodium hydrogen exchanger in the muscles. Let's remember that. So only five things to remember. Three will cause intracellular shift. Two will cause extracellular shift. Question. Based on the table I just presented, what strategies are helpful in the management of hyperkalemia? Okay, I know this is a chapter on hypokalemia, but since we discussed the shift, will that help us in the management of hyperkalemia? Yes. We just said that insulin will drive potassium into the cell. So this is a strategy to treat hyperkalemia. Actually, this is the first strategy. So when you give insulin, you give the glucose to prevent a drop in blood sugar. When you give insulin, you're going to drive potassium into the cells. So this way, you are mitigating hyperkalemia. We just said that beta-2 agonists, such as albuterol, okay, catecholamines, via effect on the beta-2 receptors, will drive potassium into the cells. So this is another strategy to treat hyperkalemia, to give them breathing treatments with albuterol. A third option, we said alkalemia, a rise in pH, will also drive potassium intracellularly, and this is the rationale behind giving bicarb. I have to say that it doesn't work in patients with chronic kidney disease or who are on dialysis. More on that when we discuss hyperkalemia, but keep that in mind. Potassium balance. Potassium excretion in the kidneys follows a circadian rhythm, meaning it's different in the morning from the evening. So potassium excretion is lower during the night and the early morning hours when we're not eating. But as the day progresses, this secretion of potassium in the kidneys, meaning excretion, because potassium is excreted by secretion in the collecting tubule, like we discussed in detail, this excretion increases as consumption of food with potassium increase. So uh, the consumption increases and then the excretion increases and this is the circadian rhythm. Now, what about prevalence of hypokalemia? Hypokalemia is common, not just in community dwelling subjects, but also in hospitalized patients. The Rotterdam study, and I'm going to refer to that a lot, not just with potassium, also with magnesium, studied 5,000 community dwelling patients. Uh, the age was 55 or older, and they found hypokalemia in about 2.5%, more common in women than in men. Hypokalemia was 
most prevalent in patients on thiazide diuretics. Obviously, if someone is on a diuretic, they're going to lose potassium. The odds ratio was 7.68, meaning they were about eight times likelier to be hypokalemic uh, compared to someone not on thiazide. Now, a study in 8,000 patients admitted to the ER found hypokalemia in 5.3%, so twice as much uh, compared to community-dwelling subjects. And if we are screening hospitalized patients, we're, we're going to find hypokalemia now in 20%. So hypokalemia is very common. Uh, I am going to stop here, and next lecture we're going to talk about the etiology, the causes of uh, hypokalemia. See you then.